And I realized at that moment that the change that we all desire, the changes that we want, the things that we want to be different don't happen until we change what we're doing, until we allow space in our life for that to happen. And none of these doors were going to Sorry. open. Mic drop moment. That's a <laughs> hardcore mic drop moment right there. <laughs> so true. None of these things were, were going to change in my life until I jumped off that cliff, until I leapt. Yeah. Because I couldn't see the doors or windows because they were, they were all blocked by what I was doing, what yeah. I was currently doing. I had to, you know, if, if, what's it? Wayne Dyer says, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And um, it's, uh, it's so true. Loud and crisp and clear. Yeah, that's a good thing. And why do we wear the headphones? So we make sure we don't go off mic if we like turn our heads around one, and two, stuff. Three, and one, two, three. Yeah. So to you. you. Would you rather not wear them? Yeah. Take them off. I don't need it. Take them off. Screw the headphones. We're rolling in all this, right? <laughs> we have our first screw the headphones <laughs> moment. STH. Screw what? the headphones. You want, you want to roll? On to, I'll do it again. No, no, you're good. We're, we're rolling constantly. <laughs> okay. So that's, yeah, one of the things here, we're just always rolling. Yeah, it feels constrictive to me. So. Cool. I love that. I no, mean, dude, I, that's amazing. I've done enough of this. Yeah, you know. Interview stuff too. That's awesome. Know that I'm not talking off mic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> See, this is already a lesson. Got you. Well, yeah, we're already getting Luke Nuncio, pay attention. We've already gotten our first lesson on listening to your intuition. Listen to your intuition. I would put the headphones on if I was going to sing, because I like to hear my voice when I sing. Yeah, yeah. Wait, do you sing? Don't let the sun go down on me. What? No, I don't sing at all. Dude, I had no, <laughs> wait, when did this happen? This, you know what, here, throw, take my iPad, throw it in the garbage. I have nothing on here that's worthy of talking about. It's a, it's a, it's a secret love of mine. It's like, you know, like a, one of those things that I, I probably would have pursued if I, if I didn't go the direction I went in. So, I mean, no I'm a closet singer and guitar player. And so. I know, I mean, I know you're a big music guy. Like I remember you, you went and saw Sting live in like what, 2013 or something, 2014. You saw him live. Yeah. I've seen him a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. What's the best concert you've ever been to? Wow. Um, or most memorable. Probably either a Fleetwood Mac concert or the Eagles concert, probably the last Eagles concert I saw. Nice. And Fleetwood Mac, you saw, I saw Fleetwood Mac recent, like the last few years. No, right? no, it's been probably eight years. since. Oh, I've has seen it been? Him, okay. Yeah. So what was the memorable but, about, about Fleetwood Mac? I just was, I grew up, you know, following them, you know, and, and loved their music. Yeah. So to see them in person and they were so good live. And I was very impressed by Lindsey Buckingham's guitar work. It was just insane. That is awesome. I mean, I never seen anybody play the guitar with their fingers like this. You know, like he 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 would pick and and strum with. Like, it was just very unique. So you have to have special fingers for that, like special yeah. dexterity yeah. for that. I mean, That's he's not... the he's you know they say it takes ten thousand hours to master something. I'm sure he's got you know fifty, a hundred thousand, but easily, yeah, probably, uh, yeah, more than that. But I, uh, you know, I grew up when I was uh, one of my first real jobs um, was working for a radio syndication company in my early twenties. Nice. Uh, 1920, and um, the uh, one of the job, one of the benefits of that job was you learned music. Mm. And this, when we produced radio shows back then, it was um, every, it was still when the thing was on tape and all that stuff. You had to yeah. cut and edit tape, but 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 we also did provided music for secondary market radio stations, about 200 radio stations. So I would go through the um, all the trades every week, Record World, Bill, Billboard, Cashbox, and and read all the charts and kind of determine what music was going to be sent to which stations. And it was different formats, different genres, adult contemporary, country, easy listening, classical, rock, pop. And so I would go through all these different things and then pick the music for these tuner radio stations and go, call the record companies and order the music for them and we'd ship out the records. So I got to know music really well. well so you had, to, you had to spot trends also, right? I mean, when you're sending out music, oh, yeah. to the, you have to know. Absolutely. So wait, so the, so the program directors of the radio stations would rely on you yeah, to spot the to trends? To help their, their playlists, yeah. so Because I always thought they were like the ones who were out there, but they, yeah. they don't. I think on the, on the bigger market stations, that's true. Right, right. But in the And the bigger market stations, the record companies send them the records. It was back when they right. did records and they don't do records anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did uh, they have payola back then still? Was that a thing? Like, because I know later on that happened. I, I'm sure they did. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they did. I wasn't part of that or yeah, aware sure. of it. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. That's so cool. So Dude, I think I, that was part of my I mean, love of music and where I learned it, but it, it's still, um, it's still part of my heart. I still love it. And that is awesome. Yeah. So since, so I'll do the rap, you do the singing, we'll go on tour. Yeah. yeah. I think this is perfect. This I'm so not, you're so, <laughs> you're so way above me and the, I can't rap to save my life. No, but that's okay. Well, you do this. Yeah. I can't sing to save my life. So it's perfect. And all of the songs, I, I don't really sing up tempo songs cause I, I'm not you know, really good. I mean, I, you know, Aerosmith, I can do some old classic rock stuff like that, but Are you more like ballads and, and yeah, like yeah. That? Like I, I'm learning shallow on the guitar right now. Oh, that's nice. So, um, I want to do a little special thing for 
my wife is a surprise. And yeah, I was wondering, yeah, so do you sing for Alexandra? Because you guys have been together for what, 12, 13 years now, right? Uh, we've been married for 14 and together for 16 years. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations on that. Thank you. And so does she get to hear you sing? Do you perform for her? She laughs at me when I sing. <laughs> Wait, why she, she's why my she worst laugh? critic, of course. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't think I can sing. She doesn't think I can speak Spanish. She, you know, it's like, but but when I talk Spanish, when I speak Spanish, and you know to other people, they're like, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But for it's her, it's not like, that good. No. She's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the kids? Because you have you have two sons and you have a daughter. Your, right. your son is what eight, eight or nine now? I have a, a nine and a half year old son and a almost twelve year old daughter, and okay. then a twenty two year old son. Okay. And what do they think about your singing and your Spanish they, and all these things? They're not. You know, they're not as critical as, as my wife. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Alex has mm-hmm. something really sweet. Have you ever gone to Alex's Instagram account? Uh, rarely. Okay. She has a, a quote on the top of her Instagram. It's really sweet. It's something to the effect of like, I know I married the right man every time I look in my son's eyes. Really? Yeah. I never do that. Isn't that sweet? That's wild. It's really, really sweet. That's when sweet, I, honey. Thank you. Yeah. Isn't that nice? I think you're talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> she it says, I know I married the right man every time I look in my son's eyes. I love you, John. Uh, yeah, so exactly. yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, dude, I'm so excited to have you here. And I was trying to think about the first time we met. I th- it had to have been an A-Fest somewhere. I just couldn't remember where it was, but it's somewhere in the world. Yeah. Was it well, Jamaica? Maybe it was Jamaica. I think it was, it was Jamaica. You were hosting that year. I, that was my first year hosting with yeah. Jeannie. That was when Kotler was speaking and everything yeah. else. And that was so much fun. And that was- Wim Hof was there. Wim Hof was there. And I told a story about, on another episode, I told a story of Wim Hof. Uh, did, did you go that night to the Rastafarian village? Yes. Okay. So and it started, it was like raining and it was like super muddy. And Wim is like dancing and he does the splits yeah. in his little short shorts. And one of his testicles falls out. And it's just one of my favorite <laughs> memories of all of A-Fest. It's just Wim just letting it go yeah. literally and figuratively. And just having so much fun so so we met a fest jamaica then yes and i feel like we really connected though uh around the mind valley certified trainer stuff absolutely when you did that in la and we just dropped in and you're just one of these guys especially just who you are to me uh you don't fit the mold of what i would typically expect from someone who has an entertainment background okay. right there's just there's not uh, and, and maybe i'm being super over generalizing here but a lot of people i met in the industry they don't have the same level of heart and you're a very compassionate, heart-centered person in my mind and in my experience of mm-hmm. you. And that's always just really stood out to me as, as, as a sign that you can be in integrity and you can be a heart-centered person and still be in the industry yeah. of entertainment. So I just love the way you well, show up in the you. world. I'm happy to have I, you. I here. don't know if that was always present. I think, I think it was always part of me. Right. But um, I don't think I always showed it during, during my career. I think it, um, it went through a period where it was, I was very focused on, you know, producing and directing and the show and the work and the business and, and, and not so present and not so mm. concerned about that. I, I know I, I found that part of myself very early in my age, very early on in my early twenties. And, but then I kind of let it go. I, I, I put it aside and while I, you know, pursued my career, which was the most important thing at that for me at that time. And, yeah. and then I kind of circled back to that being more important and then using my knowledge, my experience, my, um, expertise, my talents, and to to use that and and tell stories that were were heartfelt, and and to do programming that was for good, and 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 helped inspire people, and 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 not be salacious and negative, and and uh, and take people in the wrong direction. So yeah. Well, you've done an yeah. amazing, amazing job of that. I wanted, I want to dive into all that. And actually, so I want to know a little bit about. Let's, let's kind of. Uh, I want to hear a little bit about your dynamic growing up. So I know you were born in Hollywood. You're, you're an LA guy. I mean, born in Hollywood, yeah. raised in Studio City, was it? Yeah, raised in Studio City. Okay, yeah. cool. And then first so, Reseda, then Studio City. First yeah. Reseda. Okay, cool. And then, so, so what was the, what was the, the draw to kind of entertainment or even broadcasting is where you started, right? That's kind of where you started this part of your career is in radio and, and things like yeah. that. What, what got you into that? What took you in that direction? No, it's, it's, it, it seems very obvious, but it was my father was a radio disc jockey for uh, in LA KFWB what was the prior to FM radio AM was the, where you got all your rock music and he helped you know launch people like Elvis and Sonny and Cher and Glenn Campbell and and you know some all in that time frame during those and so kind of grew up in an entertainment you know celebrity driven environment and then he then FM radio came along in like 68 and AM went out the door and he and the station went away. So he became, uh, started his own production company, kind of producing, directing music videos, nice. uh, which were called song films back then. Song, I, I because never they were shot that. on 16 millimeters. So they weren't, they weren't videos. So, um, 
and but it's the same thing. You yeah. know, he did Leonard Skinner and Debbie Boone and and Steppenwolf and like, like all, tons of others. You know, yeah. I wonder where your love of music comes from. I know. Yeah. It, it's, it probably was ingrained in me, but uh, uh, but also I didn't. I I fought in my teens. I fought, and it's probably because you know my father um, and mother divorced when I was twelve, and it wasn't a very good time. It was pretty pretty ugly. Mm. It's pretty ugly from like eight on, but um, they fought all the time. Pretty nasty fights, like screaming, yelling. I mean, not just fought, but like throwing shit and stuff. And it's pretty uncomfortable for us and our, me and my brothers and sisters. And 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 my father wasn't around during my teen years much. And um, so it was uh, it was not an easy time for me. I was a very rebellious teenager. Mm. Loved music still. Ton, did a lot of a lot of music and a, and smoked a lot of pot. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they go hand in hand, kind of. It's, yeah. yeah, it's funny. I, I never smoked pot in L.A., but when we moved to Indiana, it was it was rampant. It was everywhere. Really, yeah. that's very surprising. So it was like you know, you couldn't you couldn't turn your head without somebody offering you a joint. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So so when your parents, but when did the Indiana move happen? Right after the the divorce, like when I was fifteen. So did you go with your dad? No, we went with our mom. Oh, All of us went with our mom okay. back in Indiana, where my mom was born and raised. Okay, interesting. And then my dad moved in with his girlfriend at the time, and then. We eventually married and, but I, I think, you know, I was, you know, I was rebellious. I didn't know what I wanted to do like any teenager. And then, and I, and I didn't want to do what my dad did probably because of all of that. Right. You know, all that stuff. Yeah. But, um, when I did the radio thing, it kind of, I got bored with it and it kind of led into television. Mm-hmm. And then I started at the bottom as a production assistant and audio assistant because it was, it was more dimensional. You know, with radio, you can only do so much. It's just, and I wanted to do something. And I found that I was a very visual person. You know, mm. I, I saw, I see things through pictures. I, and that's kind of how I relate to things is, is imagery. And so I was missing that was doing the radio stuff. Yeah. And um, so that's how, I, that's how I eventually got involved with television or started the, the process in getting in television. Got it. Okay. So yeah, so you were doing, so you're like, so with radio, you're doing that from age like 18. Just two years, about two years from okay. 19 to 21. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And I even saw, it was actually funny. I don't know if you, if you even know this exists, but uh, in, in 1983, they have this thing called the, uh, the yearbook of broadcasting and cable casting programming, where they actually had the list of all the vendors and stuff that you could hire. This is literally the thing from 1983. Oh my gosh. And on one of the pages, if you zoom in here, you see uh, total, total service. Total Zinc. service Inc. Wow. Yep. You in, did your research. In man, Woodland Hills. Yeah. And then Kent Weed, operations director, right? That there was me. It. Yeah. The oper- it, it's this D. I didn't Al- even remember my title. That's impressive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, it's this D. Alan Clark. That's not Dick. Clark though, right? No. Okay. It's another guy. Yeah. Another D. Allen, A-L-A-N Clark. Got it. Okay. All right. Awesome. Yeah. I just, I was, that's so funny that this is his company. Yeah. This is 83. So then, so, so you're in the the broadcasting stuff here, but you realize this is not the thing. There's, there's something else for you. So how did you make that bridge into the visual arts of, of TV and things like that for radio? Um, at, at that time, my, um, my father was working, he, he had started his own company called Weedy One Productions. It ended up going bankrupt, and then he he had started a show called the Academy Country Music Awards. He, he had created the show with a, his par, his friend and partner Bill Boyd, and Dick Clark was interested in the show. It's an award show. Okay, it's on every year, and uh, and Dick Clark wanted it, so he bought fifty percent of the show from my dad, and and then hired him to be a producer, staff producer for Dick Clark Productions. Oh wow! Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So, so wait, so did at some point did you and your, I, I don't know that you, you and your dad were estranged, but it sounds like you went with your mom. So did the broadcasting music entertainment stuff bring you guys back no, closer I, together? I, I, I think it did. I mean, I, listen, I, I'm a big believer that, you know, you make your own way in this world, but it doesn't mean that you can't use connections to get there. Sure. And, um, when I, when we, when we moved, when I moved to Indiana, I, like I said, I was a rebel, rebellious teenager. My mom and I fought, she was dealing with alcohol issues at the time. And I'll never forget, I tell the story once in a while, but I'll never forget, I used to, I was an tr- athlete too. I ran and I've always been an athlete my whole life. And, and I remember going after like on a five mile run in the morning and I came back home just thirsty and I go to this glass sitting on the counter next to my mom's bed, a big tall glass of, and I just take a big drink and it was vodka. And it was like, wow. <laughs> yeah, everywhere. God. It was like, it was like, and, and. And it just stuck with me, you know, it's like, it, this is like, you see this in movies. Like this, like, this is like a scene of a movie. This doesn't yeah. happen in real life, yeah. but it, it does. So, um, I mean, I'm happy to say that she's, she, she's over that now and she's, she's totally fine. And she's, she's 80. She just turned, she's turning 84 in two weeks. So wow, God congratulations bless her. to her. Yeah. That's so. amazing. 
So but, what did you what did you take from that experience of like the the taking the big swig of the what you thought was water and it was vodka? What did what you know? Did you I wish I could say that it that it le- that it made an impact on me and that like I was you know I I learned at that moment I would never ever drink like that, but it didn't. Yeah, <laughs> it was just a thing you were. Exposed it was just to. a thing that, that I you know made me realize that my mom had a problem. It made me realize that I was I shouldn't be living here, and and it kind of just and I ended up moving back after like just a year and a half there back to L.A. and live mm-hmm. with my dad and his girlfriend which wasn't fun either. Um, and then I moved out, bought my, got my own apartment when I was like, just when I graduated high school, 17, 18. So yeah, so you went for it. So you weren't the type that's like, I'm going to live here forever. Oh, no, and no, no, no. I got parents. my own place and got my, I got a job and paid my own bills and did all that stuff when I was young. So wanted to be independent and yeah. not have to depend on, on any yeah, of those Yeah, I couldn't people. get out of there fast enough. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't blame you. It's actually, and there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that I want to unpack. So, so I, I want to go back to that, but just to, to give people kind of an understanding of some of the things you've done, you've done some incredible projects you've been involved with and created hundreds of shows and different things. Some of the most notable, the, you know, Hell's Kitchen, Kitchen Nightmares, all the Gordon Ramsay shows, mm-hmm. and of course, American Ninja Warrior which is, is, is American Ninja Warrior, I don't know what metrics I'm even thinking about when I ask this question, but would you say it's the biggest hit of all the shows that you've, you've created? Uh, it's either that or Hell's Kitchen. Okay. I mean, I, I say that because Hell's Kitchen is, was, was probably on at a time when ratings were higher yeah. and more people were watching television. Or was it less broadcast. streaming back then when it Ma- came There out? was no streaming. There was no streaming. In okay. 2004, when it launched, it, there was no streaming. Yeah. Virtually no streaming. Yeah, yeah. And so... And it's been on 20 seasons versus 13 seasons for, we're in our 13th season on Ninja Warrior. Yeah. So, uh, but I mean, I think impactfully what Hell's Kitchen has done for, for people that are chefs or, or, you know, have passions for cooking, and Ninja Warrior has done for a much broader community of people that mm-hmm. are interested in health and nutrition and, and taking care of themselves and, and, and even overcoming obstacles in their lives that they never thought they could. Yeah. So it takes it, it, takes it to another level. Um, Hell's Kitchen stayed a little bit niche, but as the genre broadened out and as more people loved cooking, it broadened out with it. Yeah. 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 And, that, and that's really interesting because I feel like American Ninja Warrior is, and I've heard you talk about the show before, and obviously anybody who's seen the show knows that it's, I feel like it's really a, uh, a physical, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a show about hope and stories disguised as a physical competition. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I'm curious, have you seen an uptick in either the popularity or just the response to American Ninja Warrior during COVID? And the reason I ask is because I feel like one of the biggest things that I've seen and, and even felt myself at certain times during COVID is like, um, uh, like we've run out of future. We've run out of hope. Like there's nothing, we don't know what yeah. we can look forward to. And I feel like there's something about the stories and, and, and the overcoming obstacles that kind of gives people a hope that, oh, there's life during and after COVID. Here are stories of people doing it. Have you seen that people are even more drawn into the stories of American yeah, Ninja I, Warrior? I, I think that's a good, that's a good, you know, observation for sure. I think people are, are, are looking for something that's positive in their lives. And I think that, you know, a ninja warrior is that for them. It, yeah. it is, is something that they can still use as a way to, you know, um, as a metaphor for their, their, whatever obstacles they're facing in their lives or whatever challenges they're facing in their life, whether you're a frontliner and you need some way to escape from all the, the sadness that you see every day, you get to go to the gym or go to your, what people are doing mostly during COVID because the gyms weren't open, especially in the, the beginning phases, they're, they're building their own, courses in their, in their basement, in their backyard. And, and I've, I've seen a huge uptick in that mm. and, and they're good. I mean, they're very talented. I mean, they're very, I mean, they're impressive. It's not yeah. just like, you know, it was hashed together. These are really quality courses that they're and, and obstacles that they're building. So I think that there's definitely, um, more of a movement to, to take care of yourself in this time and, and, and to, and Ninja becomes a way to do, or the, the Ninja warrior lifestyle, I guess it becomes a way to as an outlet for you to, to feel good about yourself. It really does. I mean, yeah. and, and, the, and the, the American Ninja Warrior Junior as well, like the, the kids version. Yeah. And how has that been to work with the, the kids? What, what's the age? They're typically like teenagers, right? Or well, nine through 14. Nine through 14. Okay, so how has yeah. that been for you to, to work with the kids around yeah. this kind of a thing? The kids are fantastic. I mean, having kids of my own and, and the, knowing, seeing their love of, of doing the obstacles and, and the courses is it's just, it's, it's like when we were kids, you know, when we were jumping off of our beds and using it and, and jumping on the walls and using the door frames as spider walls. And we all, we all did this. We, I mean, we've all, many of us, I mean, we were kids. See, how far can you get around the house without touching the floor? Right. Yeah. You the know, floor that's, is lava. that's yeah, Ninja Warrior. Yeah, yeah. So, um, 
so it, it really brings back the kid in us when we see it, you know, and, yeah. and, and so I think watching the kids do it is just in, incredibly aspirational because it, it, they're doing something and they're learning how the bigger, the bigger message, you know, which is what the adults are bringing to the show beforehand, they're doing it in reverse. Mm. Yeah. They're the using this yeah. as a way to learn how to you, how that you can overcome obstacles in your life. Just don't give up, keep working at it. Always think positive. Your words affect your, you know, your reality, your thoughts affect your reality. And, and they're learning that now. Mm. So there's a lot of benefit in that versus the people like the adults that, you know, are struggled with weight or struggled with alcoholism or struggled with, you know, they're, they're a friend or a lover or a parent losing, you know, to you know, losing their life to cancer or suffering from a disease that they, they have to learn how to overcome those obstacles with this outlet. Mm. So they, re they learn it in reverse. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. The adults, we have so much to unlearn a lot of the times, right? All the crap oh. that's been put into our heads over time. Yeah. So the kids that are getting to learn this now, they're learning grit and resilience and all these things yeah. in a and way they, that, yeah. fortunately they, they, there's, you know, they haven't formed too many beliefs right? <laughs> <laughs> that they've lacked on, you know, latched onto. So yeah, that's, That's very true. true. I love that. And you know, one of the things I really love too about those two shows in particular is, is Hell's Kitchen and American Ninja Warrior is I am, and I'd love to know your take on this. I am so attracted to anything that showcases people that are masters, that are, that are living in, in a way of, 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 uh, of going towards mastery of something. And I just, I don't know, I just love seeing people that whether it's like even America's Got Talent, like somebody singing and just watching them and I'm just yeah. like, oh my God, like they have put so much work. There's, none, there's no overnight successes. There's nobody that goes on America's Got Talent that hasn't been practicing their ass off singing three hours a day for Absolutely. the last seven years, right? There's something about mastery. And, and the reason I wanted to bring this up is because one of the things I know about you and, and, and being raised by, by your father, at least earlier on, was that he said he didn't care what you were going to be, just be the best at it, yeah. right? Just be the best. And to me, that's mastery in a nutshell. So, you know, I think a lot of people are, uh, they're attracted to mastery and yet at the same time are impatient about becoming a master at something. How is they mastery, give they give up to her. So how yeah. has mastery played a role in just your own life and your it, own career? I think, you know, that's a, that's a good thing you brought up about my dad that, you know, if there was one bit of wisdom that he or belief system that he, you know, he put on me when I was young, which was, you brought up, which is, I don't care what you do in your life. I don't care what you want to be. Just, you know, if you want to be a ditch digger, doesn't matter. Just be the best damn ditch digger there is out there. Yeah. And, and that stuck to me. And I know it stuck to me because like I worked at McDonald's and, and I worked my way up to the, to, to a crew chief, like really fast. I was yeah. the best guy at flipping burgers. I was the best guy at doing it, you know? And then I worked at like a Ralph's at a grocery store yeah. and I moved up really fast. Everything I've done, I always move up quickly because I really put my de attention to it and I wanted to be the best at it. I didn't care what it was. You know, if I was Xeroxing documents, I wanted to make those Xerox perfect. I wanted to make sure it was exactly right and it didn't fray the edges. Little, every, attention to detail and doing things the best I could possibly do them and not just, you know, half-assed doing stuff. And, and that mindset and that kind of, um, built in, you know, awareness of me of, of how I treat things. And I do it with everything. Um, I think was, was the reason I was able to, to move up in it with anything I, I really put my mind to. But did you have moments in there where either you slid back or you oh, hit a plateau? hundred percent. Yeah. So how do you not just give up and be like, Oh, screw if, if this was meant for me, it should be easy. Like I so, this is, yeah. 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 I mean, here, that's the thing. That's a very good point because, you know, most people, when they hit a, a, a wall, they, they turn around or they say it's too high to climb or they say, I can't do this. And you know what? We all have those moments when we, we hit a wall yeah. and we don't know what to do or we're totally from despair. And, and there was many times that, especially when I was, you know, becoming a director and trying to advance as a director, there were many times that people told me I was no good. Mm -hmm. There were many times who told me that, you know, you're only here because you're, because you're Gene Weed's son. Mm -hmm. I, I fought the, the whole, you know, um, stigma of being Gene Weed's son for many, many years um, in, in, as I rose up through directing. I can remember, you know, many times crying, mm. just totally distraught and despair. And, and, you know, but I never wanted to give up. I always knew that, there, that I would come, out, come through it. I just had to come through it a different way. I just had to, I, you know, it's like, there was a, a show I did called Countdown at the Neon Armadillo. Mm -hmm. You probably know when it was, but I think it was 90, <laughs> I think it was in the early 90s. And it was a, it was a syndicated music show, okay. Countdown, syndicated Countdown show. 
uh, where we did like dance video, dance performances live on stage, and we had live music people like Brad Paisley back then. And all yeah. these super that are people that are superstars now, and we shot it in Florida. And, and the the executive for Disney at the time had a different agenda than I did, mm. and 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 I didn't realize it in the beginning. But all I knew is that she was always on, on my ass. Mm. That you know. You're, you know, she was always giving me shit. She was always telling me that can't this be better? Can't this be faster? Can't you do this? And I learned this, you know, she said, uh, can't you do it with less cameras? Can't you do this? And why isn't this, why is this not look as good? And why it's like contradiction or something. But she was really mean and ugly and nasty. And I remember we went to renew my contract for the next season. And, and my agent said, well, they, she, I talked to the network executive. She says that she doesn't think you're very good. You don't think you're a very good director, and you know she he, she wants to look for someone else, and and I'm like, and 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 I remember busting my ass, and I was always the kind of director that did my homework and really studied things and really planned out things really well. Every shot was planned out, and and I was totally dis distraught about. It. I was I would just and I went looked in the mirror and cried. I was like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? This is, this is so painful. I'm busting my ass, and you're working so hard, and, and no one appreciates not, yeah. it. But then you get over it, you move on. Um, about two weeks after that happened, a director came in to the booth to observe. And I thought, oh, this is the guy that's going to come in and she's trying to get him to take over my job. And, and it's, a, it's a pretty famous director of Monday Night Football. I'm not going to name names because I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to. It doesn't need to. So yeah. this doesn't affect the story. But, but I go, oh, my God. So you just, I always wanted to direct music and, and, and live performances stuff. I go, really? I've always wanted to direct football. Why don't, <laughs> why don't we trade? You could come do this. I'll go do Monday Night Football. Everybody be happy. It, that didn't work out. It didn't I happen. I was going to say, that, that would have been amazing. No, yeah. it wouldn't have happened. But, but we had a good laugh about it a few years later. But, um, but that was her agenda. He was a really good friend of hers. And he had been bugging her to come to do music. And so she was basically saying, oh, well, I got this show. I'll just put you on this show. She didn't know me from Adam. I was just a... You know, so it wasn't personal. Right. So I learned you can't take things personal. That's huge. Miguel Ruiz, four agreements, right? Yeah. Be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personal. Yep. So it was the number two, right? So, because you never know what the other person's agenda is. Right. You never know what, why, why they're doing what they're doing. What's their motivation? And nine times out of 10, it has nothing to do with you. Right. And most of the time it has everything to do with them. Right. The ego will tell you it's all about you. And you, they, yeah, you want to, you, you want to take on their stuff. It's like, yeah. wait a minute, wait, that's not, that's their stuff. That's their stuff. Uh, so I always figured a way around things when I was producing and directing the world music awards, mm -hmm. which I did for seven years, there was a producer on there. Um, uh, it was a production company, two production companies, one in Monaco and one in LA. And mm -hmm. the production company in Monaco was, the guy that was producing it was was always given, you know, making, you know, stuff about what well, this is a bullshit show, and and the lady that's running it in Monaco, she's a, she's a crazy, she's a crackpot, and and they were goofing around all the time during the production, and and they didn't, you know, they just were like phoning in, just taking the money and run, mm. and after like it was like season three, the third season of the year I was doing it, they at the network ABC said, you know, we want to make some changes. And because, you know, we want to change the show around and we think, you know, we could do better. Maybe So we were thinking of getting rid of you, Kent. And, and I go, oh, okay, well, and, you know, because we, and I, so I said, okay, well, I'm not the problem. The problem is these, these producers. Now, no, most people would have said, oh, that's too bad. But I said, you know, make me the producer because I had only directed the first three years. Make me producer, fire the, fire the people that are producing it and you'll get a better show. So they did. Really? Yeah, which was a huge... It, so there's a, a guy above them, an executive producer with another company, who was blown away. He said, I can't believe it. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? I said, because I, because I know I'll do a better job than him. They're phoning it in. Yeah. But you have to stand up for yourself. This, the, the moral of this is, if you believe in yourself, say it. <laughs> Tell it. You, what, I had nothing to lose. Yeah, and, and that's and I, I love that you're talking about this because I think it's I, I just I I can I can feel people watching this and listening and being like oh man like but if somebody said I sucked and I was terrible like I would just fall apart and I wouldn't be able to move past it and you move past it and if somebody said oh I'm gonna you know uh, I'm gonna fire you and get somebody else they would be like oh shit I guess I guess I'm not good enough but you yeah. stood up for your convictions and I remember hearing you say before that even when you started the production company with with your your production partner the A Smith and Co that in the beginning you were like I don't know how it's gonna work I just know it is gonna work. 
work. Yeah. And there's some level, I think, of irrational optimism and irrational confidence that is is needed in entrepreneurship. And I'd love to know from you, like, is that something that you lean into, kind of like, for better or worse, kind of irrational optimism and confidence? Yeah. No, it's interesting. The, the, it comes down to trusting your gut. Mm. It really does. Sometimes you get a feeling that it's just right. And you can't explain it. You can't put it into words and say, okay, well... It, and, and analyze it and break it down. And when you were talking about, you know, starting the comp production company with my partner, I had done a, I had my own production company before. Yep. And it, it was a pain in the butt. This is Wave. This is when you wave, do music wave production. I do music and, videos yeah, and dance yeah, videos yeah. And, yeah. and infomercials. Yep. And it's a lot of work and it's a pain in the butt. And, and so when, when Arthur came to me to start this new company, I was like, oh, my first reaction was like, oh, I don't want to do that again. Yeah. You know, I just want to, you know, I'm happy just directing and producing shows. It's fun and I'm having a good time. I don't have to all the worry and headache of, you know, managing people and money and all that stuff. So, yep. uh, but, but, but I also had known Arthur for a while and, and I saw this as, I saw it as a long-term thing. I see this is a game changer, a game changer for me. Something is telling me this is a game changer for me. Mm. I didn't know what it meant, but, but when I look back on it, it was like, if I'm going to make it to another level exponentially, mm. I'm not going to do that. What I'm doing right now, mm. the, the director's guild of America was basically selling out all their members. Uh, we are at a time when all the residuals that the directors used to make on shows were being dried up and direct and DJ was making deals with producers where they were taking all the residuals away. Mm. That's a whole nother story. I, 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 I couldn't even imagine what happened there. Yeah. Yeah. And all, and there's, hundreds and hundreds of directors that are being, it's a shame what's happened to them, but then they're selling their souls for pension and health and welfare, but whatever. Um, so, so I wasn't going to make, originally my plan was I'll make a lot of shows. I'll get residuals. And I'll have mailbox money the rest of my life. It'll be yeah, great. Yeah. And then that was all drying up because of the way the everything had changed. And so I saw, listen, it, if we form a company and there could be potential, you never know what's going to work, but, but this is the way to do it to have ownership of something, this is, this is how I can possibly make it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how or where, or anything. I just, you know, we each put $25,000 in into a bank and said, let's go. Yeah. And we knew that we were talented. We knew that we had passion. We knew that we were going to do things and that we were passionate about it and execute them. We knew we were both really good at execution. And, yep. and that's how it, it was just that. And I knew it wasn't gonna do it forever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah. So you knew you weren't going to do it forever. And it also feels like at the same time, you didn't have this unrealistic time horizon of we're going to start this thing and it needs to be a massive success no. in six months. Right. It's like, we're in it for there the was long no haul. timeline. There was no, there was no real timeline. clear cut business plan or, 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 you know, in three years, we're going to be here in five years. No, there's none of that. We just That's, said, yeah. we're going to make shows we're passionate about. I love that. And so yeah, yeah. So it was on. It was on mission. It was on purpose. You had, you were very clear on yeah. why you were doing this, right? It wasn't just a let's do this. To, it's not a money grab. Let's actually do this to create yeah. stuff that we want to create. You had a longer time horizon, and you had some some trust in your gut and in, in your intuition that your own track record of expertise and success, his track record of expertise, because he was like the president of Fox Sports or something yeah. at some point. So you guys had this track record of like knowing what you were doing. You join forces. You make things happen. So so to me, it feels like there's a, there's kind of a recipe in there yeah. that all of us can be looking at and kind of. Evaluate evaluating as we're going into things. Do we actually have a connection to the work we're doing or is it just a money grab? Are we surrounding ourselves with people that we actually feel like we can trust and work together with? And you guys had a really good working relationship, it seems. Yeah, very um, much so. Yeah, and does it leverage our talent and our expertise? And do we have a time horizon that's realistic enough for this thing to unfold in the way that it might be able to You unfold? break it down much better than we do. No, this is great. No, but this is great. This is, this is what I love though, because the people- It's that very the, true though. Yeah. It, you know, you align yourself with, with people that are- um, as talented or t more have talents in different areas. And like, we always joked about, he is the producer, right? I was a producer director. And, you know, he had a lot of good connections with the network. I had a lot of good connections with, you know, crews and production people and stuff like that. So we, we did complement each other very well. Yeah. And, and to your point, it was the right ingredients to, to create a, a dish that would, you know, everybody would like. Yeah. Well, and the irrational optimism paid off 10 years later, 250 developments and 150 or so shows later and yeah. what a half a billion dollars in revenue yeah. later, you guys sell it for a hundred million dollars, yeah, which crazy. for a production company, that feels like it's a, a fairly big ticket. Yeah. It's, sell. it's a pretty good sell. Pretty yeah. Good, pretty good number in 10 years. Not, not too, not too shabby. Not too shabby yeah. yeah. And then you stayed on and you were president for what? A few, a few years after a that. A few more years after that. Yeah. And then it felt like, okay, it's time, it's time to move on. Yeah. I, I, I you know, it, once you sell, you, you know, you're kind of, you have to answer to another person. We're not just answering right. to Arthur and me anymore. So right. 
we have to answer to a higher, you know, the investors and, the, you know, the owners and, every, and all the stakeholders. And so uh, they care about the bottom line. What's the margins on the show? What's this? And it, all, it starts becoming very business and very money centric. And, and so you all of a sudden you're doing shows that, you know, that you're, pre, you're doing for money. Yeah. Only for money. And I, I became very despondent about that. I, I started not performing as well. I started uh, drinking more. I started being, uh, and those are signs of being unhappy. Yeah. You know, and I started just, you know, and I knew that, um, and, you know, it was, I was almost sabotaging myself. You know, I almost got to a point where, I, where you know, I got fired because of my aunt, what I was doing, because I didn't have the guts just to say I quit. Yeah. And I need to move on. And I need to do something different. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to come out the other side and, and be able to nip it in the butt and, and, and say, yeah, I need to, I need to do something else. I, I also didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was, a, there was fear there too. Yeah. The unknown. And, and you know, and you've got society and your friends and family and every time you, how do you leave a, you know, a, 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 you know, a job that's paying seven figures a year and, and to go do what you don't know. Right. You know, right. you, you can't do that. You can't just give up something. And especially in this day and age, especially at your age, especially, you know. All the especiallys <laughs> and all yeah, the shoulds. Like and everybody, you know. And, uh, but I knew that in my heart that I, I had to do it. I knew that I, you know, it, I wasn't on, it wasn't on purpose. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And, and I wasn't happy. And I knew that when I wasn't happy, I became destructive. Mm. And, and I didn't want to be destructive. I'd been destructive t other times in my life. And it, it never turned out well. Yeah. And... And the key to that is to listen to yourself and follow your, your, your gut. And, but that took time. And, and my sister, my little sister, who, who's been my uh, partner in this growth, as, we've, as I call it, you know, the growth of learning about life and, and, and how we attack it and, and how we live it. Um, she's been to many Mind Valley. You've met Julie before. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. And Julie Super told sweet. me, said, you know, you just got to jump. You're at the cliff. You just got to jump. And I, I'll never forget the, the day that I went and talked to my partner and I was meditating that morning and I literally pictured myself on the top of a cliff and I just jumped into my meditation and just fell. And when I fell, I saw doors and windows opening that I'd never seen before. I mean, I had like these really clear, vivid images. It was like, oh my God, I never thought of that. Mm. And I realized at that moment that the change that we all desire, the changes that we want, the things that we want to be different don't happen until we change what we're doing, until we allow space in our life for that to happen. And none of these doors were going to open. Mic drop moment. That's a <laughs> hardcore mic drop moment right there. So true. None of these things were, were going to change in my life until I jumped off that cliff, until I leapt. Yeah. Because I couldn't see the doors or windows because they were, they were all blocked by what I was doing, what yeah. I was currently doing. I had to... You know, if, what's it? Wayne Dyer says, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And um, it's uh, it's so true. Yeah. So it takes a lot of courage, though. And 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 to me, and this is something that I really wanted to. to I'm glad you brought this up because I th I feel like that's not the only time in your life where you had to get really honest with yourself and make a really courageous wildly unpopular decision, there was also your first marriage, yeah. which had the same kind of thing. And it took, you know, seeing health issues from your father and, and from your brother and seeing all these things and being like, what am I doing here? So I'd Very love true. to know from you, like, what is, what does it do for us or, or to us? What does it do to our soul, to our body when we're not heeding the call of needing to leave something or change something or do something different in our lives? What does that do to us? Yeah. I, I think it manifests differently in different people. Yeah. For me, I, I was, I always, you know, turned to, to, to drinking. Um, I had had problems with um, drugs when I was younger, which I overcame and, and dealt with. But um, as I got older, it was, it was usually drinking when I had problems because I didn't want to face them. Because I didn't want to face, either I didn't want to face the emotions that were attached to them, the pain, the hurt that I was feeling, or I just didn't want to deal with it. It was a way to escape. Mm. And, and I think for other people, it gets manifested in stress or disease or illness uh, I think everybody's everybody's different, but I but it comes out negatively. It has yeah. to it has to be manifested some way when you when you're facing you know something that doesn't feel right, doesn't fit right, isn't with your nature, something you know that just isn't you know, um, 
align with your, your goals, align with your mission. And it's, you know, sometimes you don't, you don't even have to know your, your, net, your end goals, your end mission mm-hmm. to know that something's not aligning with it. You just know this is not You're it. off. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's like, off. it's like, you know, it's like you, if you're a plane going from LA to New York and all of a sudden you're over Mexico, you know, you're off. <laughs> right. Something's not right here. Yeah, you know, yeah. why are we over water? Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. 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 <laughs> So that's a key indicator. So when you start, so this is, I love this as a, as a lesson for people listening, is that a key indicator if you feel like something's off or if you feel yeah. out of alignment, this is the time to don't run from that. Really sit with it, yes. look into it and see what's going on there. And, 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 and that's what I didn't do because, because everything would tell me, you know, when you start to sit with it, it gets scary. It's like, Oh, that means something that society doesn't recognize or, or support society. My family doesn't support my, you know, friends. And, um, yeah, so you, you, you become fearful of it. Yeah. And, you know, so rather than face those fears, I just and I said, well, I'll just drink my way through it and then yeah. I won't have to deal with it. But where did you eventually find the courage, though, to say, like, that, to have that Well, you know, the universe is funny. It doesn't give up, you know. First, it's, <laughs> it's subtle. And, and then it's like, if you're not listening, uh, then it'll just start hitting you over the head. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the case with my wife, uh, my first wife, um, she had had a double lung transplant when we were right after we were first married and had, was, had to be on drugs most of her life and was also a little bit, um, cautious about, you know, doing anything or going out and taking trips or, so the, the life that we had started was very different. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm a big believer that I was put, that our relationship was all about me helping her get healthy again, mm-hmm. was helping her through this time. And that was the whole, my whole purpose of us being together. Because you didn't even know she had this condition when you guys I did, got together. I did. It was, married, it was no. a surprise. Yeah, no. yeah. I think, well, I think she did. But, she knew, but yeah, yeah, you didn't know, yeah. But, you know, a year after we were married, she was very sick and then kind of took care of her for the 14 months before she got the lung transplant and then helped her back to health. And, and I think that was it. That was, my, that was my role. That was your sole contract with her. I think that's really, yeah. I mean, that's what I believe now, but yeah. um, I don't think she believes that. But yeah. we're all, we all believe our own things. Right, so, right. Um, so... No, she's still very bitter, I think. But, uh, but I believe that that was my, my, so when it was over, my contract was over, like you, you say, what do I do now? And there was no really other purpose. I became the low man on the totem pole. First there was a dog and then there was a kid. And then, then I, I just like, goes, wait a minute, I, there's no room for me. And, and, um, and I was in a different place when I was at that age too. Sure. I don't think I was as conscious or aware of things and it might've turned out differently. But I, but I also knew that, you know, this wasn't it for me. Yeah. Um, my father was, um, had gotten cancer and died. And when he died, he was extremely unhappy. Mm. He was in a marriage that was, he was, un, I mean, amazing that he lived through this marriage because he was so unhappy in this marriage. And he, he talked about going away and, and taking his kids and going to Malaysia and, and just hiding and, and running away from it. But he never did it. In my, a year and a half before my father died, we went on a trip. I, I had been bugging him to go on a trip for like five years. And took him on a, he loved to play golf. So I took him to Scotland to play golf. Oh, wow. Finally got him to go. Like a month before we were leaving, he's like, you know, I got this show. I don't know if I can go. It's like, if you fucking can't tell me <laughs> one more time, I swear to God, you will never talk to me again. There's always a fucking show. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, he was that, that consummate producer, director. Well, I got a show. I got a show. And yeah. we all hide behind that. Yeah. Me not so much anymore, but the uh, so we, we did go and we did we did and we had a good time and he was coughing. I didn't know what the cough was about, but we had a good time. But I learned then that he was very unhappy in his marriage, but he didn't want to do what he did to. His, he had a new new set of kids mm. and like three more kids, yep. and he had new, and he didn't want to do to them what he did to us mm. when he left my mom. He didn't want to leave you know their mom. Yeah, uh, he'd rather just stay unhappy, mm. and he didn't want to do that mistake again. I don't know if that's a mistake. Maybe, but you shouldn't be unhappy. But I believe that unhappiness manifested in illness in him. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. yeah that's self-sacrifice. The doctors would tell you, well, he smoked when he was younger. It's like, whatever. Okay. Sure. Sure. But yeah, it can definitely be exacerbated. I, I think, I think for sure it manifests yeah. that, especially the unhappiness, the unfulfillment, yeah. that it takes so much courage to admit to yourself, this is not right. And even if it hurts people's feelings or so it's, it's not about being vindictive or manipulative or purposely hurting people. But at the end of the day, you do have to do 
what's ultimately right and best for all, yeah. all parties involved. And it's actually never selfish, right? Because like, even with me, I had a marriage, we were together right. for 12 years. And, and in, in the marriage, I didn't even really see as much that it probably needed to end. And, and then with space from it, I was like, oh yeah, it definitely needed to end. But I that didn't have the courage inside the marriage to admit mm -hmm. that this had run its course. And just like you said, like there was a soul contract. She was there for a lot of my healing. I was there for a lot of hers, but it doesn't mean we were meant to be together forever, but that takes so much courage to yeah. do that. So just, I just want to, I want to touch on that for one last second here. Is there anything else you think that you did or believed or practiced uh, or even practice now that allows you to have more courage, allows you to trust your gut more often and not just push it away? Uh, I think that it's the experiences that you go through, you know, like my dad dying and realizing that, you know, he died because he, he didn't want, you know, I don't want to die in a miserable marriage either. I, yeah. You know, and then a year later, my brother died. He was very young. He was only 41. I said, well, life's too short. You know, so the universe is throwing me all these things, you know, slamming me over the head, like, get out, get out, get out. Mm -hmm. It's just listening. I mean, that's, whether it's through prayer or through meditation or, you know, who, Buddha, God, um, you know, who, whatever you believe in, it doesn't do a deity or, or universe or, you, or your God if you're just an atheist. So it doesn't matter where it comes from. But, but you, you do know what's right, and you have to, to not listen to everyone else. Mm. Um, there's too much emphasis on what someone else will say, what someone else will feel, what someone else will think, what society's beliefs are on it now. And I, can't, I mean, when I, when I was going to break up with my, my wife, the, you know, my, my own family was probably my worst critics. Mm. You know, and they say terrible things. They say, "Well, she's going to die in five years. Why, well, anyway?" So just hang on there. It's like, no, you're missing the point. Right, right. <laughs> and um, she's not dead. She's still right. alive. Yeah. She's going to turn sixty this year, which yeah. is congratulations. Modern medicine. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but I think that it's, I, it's really listening to that inner voice, and and it's hard to listen to the inner voice when you're really noisy. Mm. And what I mean by that is. If you're really busy doing all these other things, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, news, whatever, whatever stuff that's flooding your brains, then it's hard to hear the inner, your inner voice. And I think that more of us need to take more time just to sit in quiet and, and listen to that inner voice, whether it's through prayer or meditation or, or just, you know, out in nature, just, you know, listening to the, the birds and the ocean or the river or whatever that, that is for you. That's where I think all the learning starts. Yeah, I That's agree. where it begins. And, and that's where you can come to some more truth in your life about what works for you and what, what's right for you. Mm. And, and follow and continue following that direction. Uh, it's when you shut off all the noise, you know, because, you know, we've, we're, we're inundated with it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and that's not kind of just the noise from our friends and family and parents and and so what society's beliefs are on everything too. Yeah, it's so powerful. It's never it's never popular to do something that goes against the grain. And yeah. you you can't you just have to not care what other people think. Yeah, because you know what, you can't please everybody. Nobody can please everybody. They're, you're never going to please everybody. So just care about the people you care about. And 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 you know what, most people come along. Most people that, are, that, that don't agree with you either see, oh, he made the right decision after all, or they, you know, they move on. Time heals yeah. all wounds. And, and as you're not doing anything. If you're following your gut, you're not doing anything to hurt anybody. Right. You're not purposely trying to hurt somebody. Right. I didn't, do, I didn't divorce my wife thinking, oh, I'm going to hurt her. Right. You know, to your point, there, there was probably, she was probably much better without me. Mm -hmm. uh, I know she was. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't, and I think, so people have to, to think longer term, you know, longer range yeah. rather than just the immediate, uh Oh, what are they going to think? Well, especially because I feel like, and, and, and I say this a lot, I feel like when, when family, especially family and friends, when they do that kind of thing, they have that kind of judgment about your decision about where you want to go, that they're typically trying to do one of two things. It's either protect or project, yeah. right? They're either trying to protect you from some terrible future that they think is, is going to befall you if you make this, this choice, or they're projecting that, hey, I could never do that thing, so yeah. you probably That's shouldn't try to do yeah. it either, right? And the great thing about protecting and projecting is that neither of those are your business. Neither of those yeah. have anything to do with you, right? So it's about 
about really uh, understanding, like you said, I love this too. There's a quote that says, you can't please everybody, you're not pizza. <laughs> and uh, and I really, I really believe that. I love that you said that because there is going to be somebody, if we're worried about being judged, you're being judged. Yeah. Everybody judges. It's, we're judgment making machines, but it doesn't have to mean anything about what it is you actually choose. So I, I just, I love, yeah. I love what you've said. That's that one of my big said. goals this year is to really work on judgment. Mm. Cause I, I really want, I'm very conscious and aware, you know, of how I interact with people. And I, and I know I'm really trying to spend more time on catching myself when I'm judging, mm. even if it's just con subconsciously judging, you know, yeah. making it, making a judgment. Yeah. And whether, you know, lately it's my judgments, that I, I see reappearing are like people in trucks that make radical moves are Trump's Trump supporters. <laughs> the radical Trump supporters. I go, where did that judgment come from? Just where did that connection come I from? I mean, yeah. that, it's like, but it, yeah. it popped into my head. I go, that's a judgment. Yeah. So, but, but, but we make judgments constantly as you know, all, and some, many of them we don't even pay attention to or notice right. them. Right. You know, right. whether, yeah, there's, you know, we all know what we're talking, what I'm talking about, but so my, my, one of my goals this year is to really, catch those judgments just like you catch a, a negative thought yeah. and, you know, be aware of them up. Oh, that's a judgment. Go yeah. back. That's not me. That's, that's society talking. That's, that's yeah. the, the news media talking. That's, you know, that has nothing to do with reality or who I am or what, what I believe. Yeah. And I love that you're, that you're laughing about it too. Like how great is it when we can catch those things and then laugh at them say, how ridiculous is it that I just had that? Huh. that kind of, Cause we don't want to judge ourselves for it either. Right. We're, oh, there you go again. Judging you yeah, suck. No, that, you that, judge. That, it's like, well, we're back in judgment again. But if we can kind of laugh at it, kind of ridicule yeah. our own judgment, then it lets us go. Well, I think that's the key to, to, to this whole thing is that the whole world about, you know, whether it's meditation and, you know, one of those things in six phase meditation that we do, you know, that a lot of us do through, through mind Valley it's one of my favorite meditations that I do quite often. I don't do it every single day anymore because I do other types, but yeah. um, you know, you do the, the first phase is compassion and then gratitude then forgiveness. And then you do, you know, your future dreaming and then your daily, you know, your perfect day. Mm -hmm. And then you thank your, you know, your higher other higher power. Um, and, and I remember when I was first doing this and going through this, I would, you know, my perfect day would always start with my kids getting up in the morning mm -hmm. And they'd be quiet and everybody getting along and it would be, you know, happy morning and no fighting and we get to school on time and sure enough, you know, all hell would break loose, <laughs> right? There, you know, nobody wants, to, nobody's eating breakfast, so-and-so's yeah. late, so, they're yelling and kicking, screaming, where's my this, where's that? And I'm like going, you know, initially I was like, this meditation doesn't work. It'd be really easy to go down the path this meditation work, it doesn't work. But I realized it's just the universe. It's just a laughing at us. It's like, it's like, oh, well, we'll see how good you do with this now. Yeah. So I became like, oh, you see that, that you're just having fun. Now you're just having fun with me. Yep. Okay. Yep. Just testing my resilience and seeing like, it doesn't mean that it always comes through that way. That's right. But, uh, but you, but it goes back to what you said about, you know, laughing about the judgment thing. Ah, you gotta be, you gotta be light with yourself. Yeah. Cause that's just, you know, you'll enjoy life more. You have much less stress. You know, you 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 mentioned that before when um, how it, things affect your health, and and I hadn't realized it, and it took me years to realize this. I went through a phase in my 30s and 40s where I was very unhealthy, mm -hmm. even though I exercised a lot. I had terrible like chronic sciatica, mm -hmm. um, and I had terrible allergies, allergies where I couldn't eat anything. I mean, I really couldn't eat anything but really? meat and potatoes. Wow! I did the test, and it's like you're allergic to everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. ice cubes is all you get that's yeah, all you, yeah. yeah you can eat meat and potatoes but like butter and, and everything you know oh, sorry yeah, yeah. strawberries and the headphones wouldn't have helped that by the way <laughs> they would not have. my hand my hand just flails okay yeah. you're an expressive speaker Kent. that's what i love about you it's perfect <laughs> but um but you know a lot of that was because of my unhappiness in the marriage mm. and in manifesting unhealthy in my body yeah Today, I have no allergies. I have no sciatic, no back problems, nothing. Wow. You know, this is 20 years later, so. Um. That is, it's nuts. I mean, it's, it's so true, though. I mean, I've, I've experienced the same thing in my life, but I think you're Yeah, you're you have, right you've gone that. through a whole transformation, which is amazing. A ton of it, man. I've experienced the exact yeah. same thing, so I, I know it to be true for myself as well. And actually, I'm, so I'm curious about something. I want to I shift gears for a second. I'm really curious on, on your take on something. So you're a TV guy, obviously. Did you ever watch the show um, Good Place? with uh, Ted Danson and Kristen Bell. It's uh, recent years. It was on for three or four seasons on NBC. I don't and, think so. Yeah, so it was about uh, uh, Kristen Bell's character dies and goes, it's kind of like a purgatory. It's the afterlife, but it's really more the purgatory. And Ted Danson is the architect of the afterlife. And it's a really funny thing because 
when they first get there, uh, 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 Kristen Bell has died and gone to this place and she kind of like wants to know what's up with the afterlife. And so she asks uh, Ted Danson about this and they're in his office and there's this picture on the wall of this guy. His name is Doug Forsett. And he's just a really normal looking, you know, Midwestern guy. And so she's like, what's up with the dude with the picture here? And, she, and Ted Danson says, well, you know, the, the Buddhists and the Christians and the Jews, they all kind of are about 70% right about what happens in the afterlife. But this guy, Doug Forsett, who lives in like Idaho, <laughs> he got really high on mushrooms one night and was just talking to his buddy and he nailed it to about 94% of what <laughs> happens in the afterlife. So I, I just always love that, that part of that show. And, and the reason I bring that up is I'd love to know just from you, what do you think happens when we're done here? What do you, what do you think happens after we die? Well, that's a good question. I, uh, I don't give much thought to it, to be honest with you. Um, I do believe that a part of us continues on, mm. you know, if you want to call it the soul. Um, I don't think there's a, a big place up in where we all see each other and high five, but, but I think it's in a bigger, it's in a bigger picture thing. It's hard, it's hard for people to grasp, but to me, it's like all of a sudden you become aware of everything mm. and, and, and by being aware of everything, you are part of everything. So you feel everybody. Um, when I meditate sometimes and I, I meditate about love and compassion and, sp and sharing that all over the world, I really do feel love and compassion from people all over the world. Mm. I can feel love and compassion from someone in South Africa or Japan or Ukraine or Great Britain. I, I, I feel it come back to me. People that I've touched, lives, people in the lives I've touched because I, I send it out there and as it comes back, I, and I feel like it's only just a piece of it. It's mm. a small part. I think that you become immediately aware of everything and that, and the meaning of life and that love is everything and that we are all love ultimately just sharing the same space and not realizing it. Mm. And so, so, so seeing everybody when you go to heaven to me is not like we see each, you, like I see you and you see me. Yeah. It's more sensing and feeling and, and knowing them, you know, just, Oh, you know, hi, so and so, I, oh, there's so, oh, oh my God, and you're, you're just everybody's there, yeah, um, and everybody's of the same, you know, feeling and mindset and love and the, the universal, you know, knowledge that they know everything and there is to know. Yeah. So I think it's very peaceful, and I think there, I don't, I don't know, that's what I feel it is. Yeah, uh, I think it's, you know, and I don't think it's you know, as a physical place. It's more of a, a sense and a feeling. I feel like, and the reason why I think that is because. In my meditations, I, I've I've kind of gone and traveled, you know, like out in the space and stuff like that, and yeah. and and had a sense of it, a glimpse of it. So I know it's not seeing like you see; it's it's more sensing. It's more sensing, yeah. And I love what you said there because it's actually really funny because what it sounds like you're saying, which I think is freaking beautiful, is that whatever that kind of looks like or might look like in the afterlife, you're able to experience the sense of that now when you're in your meditation, you're feeling the yeah. compassion and the oneness and the connectedness with everybody, whether you've met them or not. It's like you got, that's kind of a heaven on earth kind well, of a and, thing. And some people say this is heaven. Yeah. You know, there's a whole, you know, we just got to, we just haven't figured it out yet. We haven't yeah. found it yet. But yeah. That's, yeah. You know, it's funny, actually. So here's, here's something really funny. Here's a little universal thing. So we have a, a segment of the show, a game that we play here called The Mixtape of the Mind. And okay. the mixtape of the mind is where I find a song lyric. It's typically a rap lyric, but I changed it for you. Uh, so <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no problem. So it's a, it's usually a, it's a lyric from a song that we can pull some kind of personal growth lesson out of. And for some reason, this uh, lyric stuck out to me and I saved it for you. And now I know exactly why this is perfect. So this is actually from a sting song from 1986. It's a song called consider me gone. I don't uh -huh. know if you remember the song. Um, and the, the, the line from the song is I've spent too many years at war with myself the doctor has told me it's no good for my health. To search, per, to search for perfection is all very well, but to look for heaven is to live here in hell, mm -hmm. right? And, there, and so now what you just said, it's, it's exactly to me, at least what I take from this, is the power of being present yeah. and being here and, and, and loving and doing the things here and not being at war with yourself, being at love with yourself and other people. And I feel like you just reflected that Without even, yeah, without even very knowing true. It. There's a lot of, a lot of that symmetry in that. That's beautiful. Synergy, yeah. I love that. Well, that actually, and that's a perfect segue really. So 
now the the work that you're doing in the world and, and what you're so passionate about, I mean, it's it's all things to me at least related to health, whether it's mental health, physical health, whether it's you know meditation and mindfulness or biohacking and things of that nature. So so tell me about this this transition for you from you know being a director, being a producer, to really going all in on coaching and teaching and facilitating and helping people experience the mindfulness and the meditation and the and the health stuff. How has that transition been for you and what kind of even led you in that direction? Yeah. Um it's been interesting. It's been, it's been challenging because I think that there's, there's all, there's always challenges you face, but I think, you know, everybody talks about COVID and the, the biggest, the big picture look at it is um, kind of like when I started the company with my, my partner, I didn't really have an idea what it was going to look like. I just knew that I had something to offer mm. and, and that, once again, I've been doing this for a while. I've been doing this for like the last eight years or maybe more now. Um, studying it, researching it, practicing it, delving into it. I mean, when Dave asked me started the Bulletproof thing, you know, I was right there in the beginning. Yeah. And so I've been part of biohacking since, the, since he's, he did it. So yeah. it's seven years, I guess, seven years or so. Um, and I, I'm like a get my own human guinea pig. I tried everything. And then when it goes to spiritualness and meditation and mindfulness and all that you know i i was one of those guys that did everything read every book and tried every course and then you know came across vision in his book and got involved with mind valley as you said and became a, a certified trainer and and ex kept expanding my my knowledge and information and, and kind of studies and stuff and all of a sudden i realized i knew a lot and i had experienced a lot and as i started sharing my stories with people I realized that it was helping people. Mm. And then I did a couple of seminars for Mind Valley, and, and when I shared my story, it was, it was impactful. And then people asked me, hey, would you help me? Would you coach me? Would you do this? And then I realized that, that okay, so there's, there's something to this. And, but I'm also very, you know, pragmatic too, and, and, and I, I want to help people in a bigger way, not just, you know, a small way, you know, so yeah. I, I, I like, you know, individual people I want to help too, but, but I want to, I want to make a dent, like you say, you know? Yeah. So balancing the micro and the macro, yeah. right? Yeah. Helping in the, in the small realm where you can, right. but also contributing in the bigger, the bigger picture. So I, I realized that, you know, last year I'd launched um, four seminars and I had a couple of speaking engagements that were lined up for keynote speaking and, and then COVID hit and everything went right. away. Right. So I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I guess it's not supposed to happen right now. Yeah. I guess I, I'm not ready or, or something bigger is going to happen or something. So rather than go, oh no, what am I going to do? Oh no, the world's crashing. Oh, oh poor me. Yeah. Uh, that's not me. <laughs> I rarely do that. I don't think I ever do that anymore. Well, where, but where does that, like, I, and I, it's that, and that is, a, that's a thread that I keep seeing. And I just, I love, I love that that's the way you are. And so for people who feel like, oh, well, that's not available to me. I could never be that way. <laughs> it just doesn't work for me. What, what kind of, uh, either a practice or an insight or something, what, what, what has been helpful for you? To, and maybe it's just kind of a natural thing and you don't even know, but like, what has it been for you where you're like, yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to, it's going to figure itself out. It's going to unfold. I'm going to yeah, make yeah. it through. I, I tell you what it is. It, it's, it's so simple. People are going to just like not believe it because they'll just, you know, but it really is a mindset. Uh, and it's supported with different actions. So the mindset is, is, is really simple. It's, Everything will work out. Mm. It may not work out the way you pictured it, but it, it'll work out. And having that mindset allows you to look for positive outcomes. Mm. It allows you to open doors and, and windows that you maybe not have thought of because you were so close-minded that, you know, the world's going to end. Um, but you also have to support it with actions, daily meditation, positive thoughts, catching, you know, I really am a huge believer and I teach my kids this, that your thoughts create your reality. And anytime I catch them saying something negative, I throw it right back at them. Mm -hmm. My son just last night was like, I was doing a spelling bee with him or spelling and he goes, oh, I'm so dumb. I go, no, you're, stop it. You are not dumb. Take it back. Catch yourself when you say stuff like that, you yeah. know. Catch it in real time. Real time. And, yeah. the, and I tell my older son, my 22 year old, I, I had sat down with him for two hours before Christmas talking about this. He's in last year at college and, You've got to start catching yourself. Mm. And what happens is when you, when you focus on it, when you catch, you know, you'll say it and they go, you might not even reach, realize it right away. It might take minutes. It might take later in the day. You might know, oh my God, I said something really 
ugly to myself. Mm. You'll never be able to do that. You'll never be able to, you know, the more you spend attention, the more you focus on it, that time shortens. Mm. So what took a couple of minutes for you to realize it becomes a minute, becomes 30 seconds. The more you focus, all of a sudden, all of a sudden you'll say it and go, what? Oh, catch yourself. Then you get to a point where you preempt it. Mm. You'll feel it coming, but you'll catch yourself before you have the thought even. Mm. I know that sounds really strange, but you do. You do eclipse time in a way. You do get to a point where you don't have it anymore at all. Yeah. Where you, where you can almost change it from a negative to a positive thought before you have the thought. Because you get ahead of it. That's yeah. how, how quick. It, and, that, and when you get to that point, well, then, it, it, then you've, you've, you've kind of, you've, you've solved the problem, so to speak. Yeah. You see through the matrix. You yeah. Know, you know what's coming. Yeah. That, that's, I, I love that. And that's, and, and I think that's such a powerful thing you said. And, and the, there's a couple things in there that I, I want to just kind of reiterate, make sure I got right, but also for people listening, because I think it's really powerful. Number one, the, uh, it will always work out. Uh, doesn't mean it always works out to your preference, right? Right, but it always works out, right? <laughs> yes. So there's there's the removal of like the entitlement of I know what's best for me, yeah. right? Especially I definitely don't know what's best for anybody else. I barely know what's best for me. But to think that I know what's best for me, and so if it doesn't unfold under my preferences, then it didn't work out. Yeah. So that first thing is like it's going to work out. It just may not be to your preferences. That's huge. And the second one is is that that incremental practice. Right, it's not that you sit down for meditation once and then you never have a negative thought again. Yeah. It's not that you catch a negative thought once and then you never have that same self talk show up again. It is a practice. That's why it's called a meditation practice, not a meditation done. Yeah. Right, and so you have to just do the practice one at a time. And I always think about like uh, in in baseball, uh, when uh, when a batter's on deck and they're swinging five bats around, it's so when they drop the four bats and they have just the one, it feels lighter. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's it's that it's that practice. And and from what you're saying, I've, I've this metaphor I've never thought of before until you were just saying this is that then they get to a point where they they've practiced so much that when the ball even leaves the hand of the pitcher, they know where it's going. Yeah. They know where it's going before it even shows up, which is kind of what you were saying. You know where the thought's going to come before it even shows up. And so you can prepare yourself for it and, and do what you need to do to, yeah. to redirect it. So that to me is a very powerful practice. And, and you know, we, it's so funny because we don't, we always, you know, we spend a lot of time on things in our life that don't really show up in a life that any way that's positive for us. Um, but if you truly want to get better at something, you have to practice at it. Mm -hmm. And if you want to get better at life, you have to practice the skills to get better at life. And whether you, you know, just like if you have to go to the gym every day to lose weight or to gain muscle, this is a muscle you have to, you have to work too. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. And, you know, people, I just was talking to someone the other day about meditating. She was saying, I've just started having panic attacks. I'm going to be, you know, 59 this year. I'm going to, have, I'm, I never had panic, in my, in my panic attacks, sorry, panic attacks in my life. And I've known this girl since I was a teenager. And I said, I let her talk and let her talk, you know, the coach in me, right? Yeah. Let her, let her, don't, don't jump in too soon. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then, you know, let her mention meditation. Oh yeah. Well, how, have you tried it? And I do this yoga thing. Then. So, but she had never, I, I can't do it. I can't do meditation. I go, I go well, you win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you win. You win. <laughs> You're right. What do you mean? Well, if you say it, you must be right. Cause you know, the other thing I tell my kids and I tell people all the time is that our brains don't know the difference between a negative thought and a positive thought. Mm. So all they know is what you tell it. It's like a computer. You can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. Type that in. You can't do this. You can't. What's your computer going to say? Okay. It's going to sit back. What's it going to say back to you? You can't do this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you've told it. Yeah. How's it going to respond differently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so you got to, you, you have to replace those negatives with the positives. So, when she told me she couldn't do meditation, I said, well, what do you think meditation is? Well, I can't quiet my brain. I can't, well, you're not supposed to quiet your brain. Who told you you had to quiet your brain? You know, it's like, it's called the monkey brain for a reason. It yeah. never stops. All meditation is, is a way to replace the, what's going on in the monkey brain with something else. So try something that replaces those thoughts with something else. And we got into a long a conversation. I turned on to the sixth phase because I think that's a good, a good way to occupy your brain matter while, you know, while you're meditating. Yep. Cause it gives you some focus. Um, but I think that it's, if we can get people to, to not be so heavy about everything mm. and, and not let things bother them so much and, and it becomes much easier. And 
it's very scary right now when I see the division in, in America and all the, the emotions and anger that are out there. Mm. And, and I'm not like really sure over what. <laughs> Well, it's fear, right? I mean, like if, oh, if, you, if, if, if we took the people who were the most divisive and sat them down with each other and got them to truly admit what they were afraid of to each yeah. other, they'd probably come together, right? Even the ones who are the most, well, maybe not the most radical, but, but people that are kind of leaning really hard to either direction, if they were just to say, you know what, I'm really afraid that my kids are not going to grow up in a country where X, Y, Z is available to them. The other side would say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid for my kids not being it. Yeah. And it's like, we would see we're much more alike than we are different. No, you're absolutely right. It's but it takes, point. takes consciousness to do that. And I think meditation is, is another great way to do that is to slow things down, not be so heavy. Uh, the six phase is a great meditation. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. And actually today is Vision's birthday. So funny no, that we're, yeah, so we're actually talking about Vision's about meditation. That. So happy birthday, Vision. Uh, yeah, happy birthday, uh, Vision. Uh, this is going to come out way after his birthday. Oh, was that your birthday still. party last year? That's, oh, that's right. That was a year yeah, ago. Were you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, oh my gosh. That is that was crazy. Fun. It was really fun. That was one of the last parties we really, you know, got to have. I well, think I got this there. Did you really? Oh yeah, that's right. Because Chris was there handing yeah. out the Mayan tent bracelets. Yeah. That is right. That's another and shout this out. This is the to one Chris I got Pan. there. Actually. What does yours say? This is. I have a few of them. This one's compassion. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh man. So so there's one one last thing here. A couple things. Last things I want to talk to you about. So. Uh, one of the things that I know a lot of, uh, the people I work with, and I think a lot of the people that watch this show are creatives and they would love to put their work out in the world. They have a dream, they have a message, but they are deathly afraid of being visible, right? The fear of being judged, the fear of being wrong, the fear of, of getting it wrong, the fear of being ridiculed, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And to me, you've had a really interesting transition because I remember you even telling the story about how Arthur, uh, Arthur Smith wanted his name on the door. And that's why it was a Smith and co. And the joke was that you were the co. And the reason you were okay with that is because you're like, yeah, I'm the behind the scenes guy. It's kind of, I'm, I'm the guy that makes it all happen from behind the scenes. Now you're the front of the scenes guy. You're the guy at the front of the room on the stage, doing the speaking, doing all these things. How has that been for you to transition into being a more visible figure when you were traditionally behind the scenes? Um, uh, it's been actually relatively smooth transition. And I think it's because, um, my message is pure and it's, it's very purposeful. It's like, I feel very comfortable doing it because, uh, what I have to say comes from my heart and it's not, it's not a script. It's not, you know, um, it's not forced. It's not unnatural at all. So, um, I think it's just like a musician that, that you know, learns to master an instrument that he gets so comfortable that it's like he's playing in his living room. I still get, I still get a little bit of nerves right before I go up there. And you actually taught me something, um, which is always going to stick with me is that when you go up to speak, remember that you're not speaking for you. It's not about you. It's about them. Yeah. And put your ego aside because uh, the, we all, you know, I think that what's the, you remember the Oprah quote that, uh, the, the one question that all her guests ask her after the, after the interview, no. how'd I do? Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that combined with what you taught me yeah, really re related. It's like, it's not about how I did. Oh, I love that. But how they did, how yeah. they, how they feel, how they're doing. I love just so, the focus off of you going into service. Yeah. You, you know, you were very instrumental in me, in me taking that shift and developing more comfort in front of people because of that mm. and getting out of my own way. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't how I did. Yeah. You know, it, it was more about how, how impactful I was with them. Yeah. And and, then, yeah. And you said something there too, that I think is really important. And I think this is a big shift for people who are afraid of, of visibility is they're afraid of that. They're not going to be like the all knowing expert. And there was nothing about what you just said that says, Oh, I'm confident being the best mindfulness meditation teacher in the no. world. You, you, <laughs> you said yourself that the reason that it's been impactful for people uh, primarily or first and foremost was you sharing your experience of the thing. Yeah. And I think that if, if people are, are worried about being visible, realize you're only an expert in one thing and it's your experience of life. You're not saying it's everybody's experience. You're just saying, here's my experience of life. Take from it what you will. Your mileage may vary. Yeah. Right. So do you feel like that's kind of the, the approach you take? It is the approach. It's also very similar to our storytelling techniques with the shows that we produce is that, you know, we tell relatable stories. Yeah. We tell stories on American Ninja Warrior of people overcoming obstacles in their lives so they can compete on the hardest obstacle course in the world. And those obstacles that they face in their lives are very relatable to most of the audience. If it doesn't relate to you, one story doesn't relate to you, another one may. Mm. And 
And when I tell, when I go up and speak, I'm talking about stories that I think are relatable to people. I think I shared with you that one of my speaking events last January was I shared, you know, the top 25 challenges people face in their life. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's drugs and alcohol, loss of a family member, you know, serious illness, you know, and I listed like 25 of these things. And, and how many of you, how many of you out there have faced this? And oh, uh, someone faced this, oh, you face that, okay, great. And what, what happened to you and what happened to you? And, and then I talk about my journey and, and through, you know, and, and my ups and downs and, you know, everybody thinks that, you know, you're a producer director that, oh, there's Kent, he's, you know, sold his company and he's living the good life and down Laguna Beach and he's happy and healthy and wealthy. And it wasn't always that way. Right. <laughs> there, you know, we don't just go, they doesn't, the, the path to success doesn't just go like this. It goes like this, like this. It goes all over the fucking place. It looks like, like a kid with a crayon on oh a white carpet. Oh my god, carpet. it's, it's yeah. ugly. It's, it's you know you don't you don't want to see it. It's like there's you know there's a lot of ugly times to get from here to here. You know yeah. it doesn't go like LAX to JFK. Yep. But um, so the, the 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 thing about the um, the speech after I gave that whole thing is I said I'll probably pull up the list and again I said of these twenty five things. Guess how many of them I faced? And I highlight them in 23 of the 25 I'd faced in my life. Wow. And all of a sudden the audience goes, wait, so you're just like me. Mm. You know, they, there's a relatability. And, I, and, and we, all, we all face stuff. We all yeah. have loss. We all have fears. We all have doubts. We all, you know, have illness and disease. And we, we go up with challenges all the time, you know. And so it's really when we going back to what you said already about if you brought the far left and the far right together and they sat down, they might see how much similar they are with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's so huge. So yeah, just being putting yourself out there in an authentic way and in, in a vulnerable way so that people can relate to your experience. Cause it really yeah. is a shared experience no matter who you are. And then, and then saying, you know, what works for me, you know, yeah, it's like, guys, this is what I found that works, you know, for me. And I, I believe that the cocktail is a little bit different. Everybody has to mix their own ingredients. Yes. Here's, here's a list of things, all the ingredients that are out there. This is what I choose to do that works for me. You've got a lot of stuff out there. Go check it out. See what works for you. Ben Greenfield's a great um, resource for this. And um, he never wears a shirt, though. Do we need to give him some? <laughs> do we need to have a collection together to buy him a shirt? I'm just kidding. <laughs> if I look like Ben Greenfield, I probably wouldn't wear a shirt exactly. very often either. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I love what you said. It is. It, there's no one size fits all. No. And and so if you're trying to be uh, people who are listening, if you're trying to be a sage on the stage who knows it all and has the formula down, you are going to feel like an imposter and you're going to be afraid of getting it wrong. But if you show up like Kent's talking about, being in a place of service, sharing your own story, saying here are here's the cocktail of the things I, that has worked for me. Just try something. What Whatever it is, yeah. just try something. You can't get it wrong. There's no way to get it wrong when you're owning it in that way. Is, is what I think I'm hearing. I, I feel I feel that's the truth. You speak your truth, and then, you know, if like you said, it you can't go wrong that way. Yeah, you just can't go wrong when you're when you're authentic. Yeah, because nobody can accuse you of <laughs> not being you when you're being you. It's true. Yeah, I mean, they can try, but I'm just like I don't know. I mean, that's and the by thing the way, that, some people may still not like 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 you. And that's yes, okay too. Very true. I. Th I didn't, he, he didn't get it. That person didn't get it. What's wrong? What, what, why don't you get it? No, you don't ever go there. You go, well, oh, he didn't get it. Right. Yeah. I, he, somebody, he'll get it from someone else. Yep. I just wasn't the one. Yep. Yeah. And the way I've talked about this before is like, you know, when I'm on stage and I talk about being 332 pounds and being suicidal and, and having this deep depression, somebody may stand up in the audience and say, well, I'm 400 pounds and I've never been happier in my entire life. To which I would say, I'm so happy that that's your experience. Yeah. For me at 332 pounds, I it was, wasn't working. It wasn't working. Right. So that's, I love that you don't feel, I'm, I right. never want anybody to feel that way. So thank God that you yeah. don't feel that way. And for everybody else who maybe does feel what I'm feeling, this message is for them. No. That's beautiful because it's not there's no judgment involved. Right, there's no judgment at all. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit and then we're gonna get into the last thing here. So another game that we like to play here is called Ooh, That's a Tough One. And so Ooh, That's a Tough One, it's just a very simple, fun little sure. would you rather game. So I'd love to just hear your, uh, your responses to this. So number one, Kent, would you rather have skin that changes color based on your emotions or tattoos that appear all over your body depicting what you did the day before? I'll take the color. You'll take the color. Take okay. The <laughs> so like, so, so that means like if you, if you are angry, your entire body just gets like red, bright red, bright red. Red, Yeah. And then everybody knows what to expect from you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 you know why I answered that way? Cause I have a, a feeling that I, my emotions are 
I don't get angry a lot. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't, I don't ever think I get depressed. I don't ever get depressed actually. So I think that, you know, I'm at a, a place now that my emotions are much more level, you know? Mm. So it's not a concern of skin color changing. No, no. So I'm <laughs> less concerned about that than the tattoos because I don't know about, about every, I don't want everything that I did yesterday, you know? <laughs> that's very, that's very telling me either you're doing some really weird shit. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, we all have our things. So I, I, I don't know if they're all shareable right now, but you know. I would probably go with the skin as well. The skin color as well. I don't think I want my stuff tattooed, especially when my mom is still around. Uh, so, okay. So second one, um, would you rather be an amazing painter or a brilliant scientist? Painter. Mm, why? Visual. I, I love. I'm, I'm a visual artist. I, 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 I think I see the world in pictures. Yeah. So I've always admired that. Yeah. Have you ever painted? Have you ever tried to get into the medium of painting? I, only when I was young. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'll become. Was it Winslow? Uh, you could be like Jim how, Carrey. How long was the Homer? Is that how old he was? Winslow. I don't even know. The painter started when he was 75 or something like that. Really? Yeah. That's kind of, so I have time, Nuncio, I have time to start becoming a painter. That's, that's amazing. Okay, would you, this is one of my favorites. Would you rather never get a paper cut again or never get something stuck in your teeth again? Oh, that's so easy for me. Which one? I would take a thousand paper cuts a day over getting stuff stuck in my really? teeth. Really? Oh my God, I'm the total opposite. <laughs> why, why would you, paper cuts are the worst. Okay. Yeah. So, so what is it about? You're okay with, you're okay with the paper cuts. You really well, don't like Well, it's not that I'm okay teeth. with the paper cuts. It's just, I really don't like getting stuff stuck, stuck in my teeth and I get stuff, stuff stuck in my teeth all the time. Yeah. And it's a no, it's really, I can't get it out. It's like. Now, do you have good enough friends and is Alex the type that'll say, Hey, there's something in your teeth? Yeah. Without a doubt. Okay. Yeah. Cause I have, I, I was this past weekend, I was hanging out with a few people who have all had COVID. So it's all safe. Uh, and I, the, I only have one friend in that little group that told me that I had something in my teeth and it was there for like two hours. And she came right over and said, Hey boo, you got something in your teeth. And I'm like, that's a real friend. Right. Yeah. That is a real friend. Okay. By the way, I know that yeah. we're sitting on the couch here. We, I've been tested two days ago, so I'm COVID yep. free. Just so you guys know, that's yep. why I'm not wearing a mask. Just yep. so we present the proper optics. Yes, very, very good. Yeah, a lot of the TV shows now are putting that Opti in the beginning. Optics, optics are big. <laughs> For all of our sponsors. Uh, yeah. Today we're sponsored by NyQuil and uh, Moderma. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, uh, all right, and the last, ooh, that's a tough one, is, and this one's an environmental one, okay? Would you rather give up showering or give up beef? Well, I know I eat beef, so that's... That, that, that's an easy one. Okay, yeah. so, okay, so, and the reason I brought that up is because, obviously, and I'm sure you know this, it's like 25 times the amount of water to, to eat a, cow, to, to eat a hamburger, yeah. Than, than to do a plant-based yeah, thing. And, and so, and the reason I brought that up is because one of the things I know you're really passionate about as well is being on the board of the Water Keepers Alliance. Yep. So this is this, this organization that was started by Robert Kennedy Jr. And it's all about bringing clean water. And I'd, I'd love for you to just talk more about that organization yep. and water why you're so was passionate. Water started 20 years ago on the Hudson River to help clean up the Hudson River, which was a disaster. Mm. It was one of the most polluted rivers in America. And it was started by a couple of river keepers that brought Bobby Kennedy on, Robert Kennedy Jr., as you said. And he became an advocate for them and a lawyer to help stop them from dumping pollutants, the factories upstream to stop dumping from pollutants into the river. And that was their first big win. And then that launched a, um, a kind of a groundswell of local river creepers throughout the country mm. and which formulated the Waterkeeper Alliance. And the goal of the Waterkeeper was these grassroots organization where people that was protecting their own waterways tasting samples, making sure that far, pig farmers and coal industries and oil industries and all the big factories weren't dumping their stuff into the rivers. They would help prosecute them under the Clean Water Act. Oh, wow. And bring these companies to, to justice. The biggest case they, la they landed two years ago was the DuPont $50 million case to clean up the mess that they had made in, in the river in, in um, North Carolina, or South Carolina, sorry. And... So it's grown now in 20 years to over 300 water keepers in 150 countries. That's and, incredible. And the, the goal and the mission is to provide clean water for everybody, mm. is to, to protect the, the, our right to clean water. There, you know, only 1% only of the water on earth is, is fresh water that we can really? drink. So, and with the amount of pollutants and the amount of you know, farming and stuff that we're doing, we're putting that all into jeopardy. Mm. You know, there's... 785 million people a day that go without water really in the, in the world yeah so it's really it's 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 a, you know part of its climate change part of its pollution part of its you know big big companies big for, you know big corps 
so it's bringing awareness to people that there's a need to clean, to keep the water clean and to preserve our water, which, cause there's so little of it mm. and to look after it and to support, you know, companies that are in organizations and charities that are doing that. Um, you know, there's many, many people in, in many countries that have to walk, you know, five kilometers a day to get fresh water. Mm. Um, especially in rural areas, you know, so, yeah. and then, you know, there's a huge amount of the population that dies every year from waterborne diseases. So keeping, protecting the water that we have and keeping it clean and, and making sure we have clean water, you know, it's, it's our right, number one, mm -hmm. under the Clean Water Act. Number two, you know, we need it for life. Yeah. You know, we can go, what, almost eight weeks without eating food, but three days done. without water, you're done. Yeah. And, and people need to realize that, that it's a, that's an issue that we have to look after. And, and big corporations, big farm as you know, poultry and pigs or something are jeopardizing our water. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they're basically taking away something that's our right to have. So, uh, so I'm a big, big, listen, I've been a big water sports fan my whole life, big surfer and, and yeah. love, you know, lakes and fishing and stuff like that. And it's, it, to me, it's, it's more the importance of, how vital this is to our life, our lives yeah, and, and protecting it. So, and it's a great organization and I think they've done a great job and now I'm on the board of directors with them and I chair the strategic planning committee and I chair the communications and marketing committee. And that is amazing. It's a big passion. My son is doing a report in, in, uh, he's in, uh, first grade. He's doing a report on water. Really? Yeah. Right now. No yeah, way. Whole power, he's doing a PowerPoint in first grade. That is, he's going to be on the board. They're going to kick you off and put him on the board <laughs> soon. That is amazing. Okay, yeah. well, we'll put in the show notes the, the, the website for the Waterkeepers Alliance to check yeah, that waterkeeper. out. Waterkeeper.org. Waterkeeper.org. Perfect. And we can donate on the site and, and yeah, do all absolutely, that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, amazing. And, and yeah, and you've become an environmental activist. It's not just the water stuff. You also, didn't you ban like all plastic, uh, single use yeah. plastic uh, water bottles? Was it Hell's Kitchen or? We did, a, we started a whole uh, sustainability program on Hell's Kitchen. So we got rid of all plastic water bottles and then a whole recycling plan. Uh, everything, everything was recycled, all the from craft service and all the paper that was recycled, everything we used. So um, it was huge on the last season of Hell's Kitchen. And then American Ninja Warrior, three, four seasons ago, I got rid of all plastic water bottles. Wow. So, and you brought in uh, like multi-use yeah, bottles. Or yeah, whatever, the, first, right? the first year, um, anytime you want to do something good, there's always a reason not to do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> usually from corporations and like, right, and the like. Right. so when I wanted to do this to get rid of plastic water bottles on the set of, of American Ninja Warrior, the, the person that does the budget said, well, it's going to cost more money. And you know, this is a, this is a show that the budget is $36 million a year. Mm -hmm. and, well, how much more is it going to cost? I asked him yeah. like $13,000. <laughs> it's going to cost $13,000. a rounding more. error. Really? <laughs> Wow, thirteen thousand dollars. We don't think the network will come up with another thirteen thousand mm dollars. -hmm. No, no. Well, how about the production company? Oh, no. Okay. How about me? <laughs> so, um, so, so you finance it yourself. The though? first year, I, I I bought the plastic water bottles. Wow. I bought the um, the reusable water the reusable, bottles. Yeah. But wow. we've been able to keep it on, and and you know, and they've the, the production company and and. Uh, which was my company at that time. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's done a great job in supporting the, supporting it. And, and they only did it because of me. Mm. Um, so I really appreciate all that, that they've done. And they've really come up with really good ways to, you know, we had we had our own, you know, fountain set up and, you know, water from the city and that was filtered and all that seasons. And last year we, we went to canned water. They have canned water now. I didn't, I didn't, know, they had, I know they had box water. I didn't know they had canned water. Canned water, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went to recyclable canned water. That's awesome. Because it was it was more sanitary than the the fountains now and reusing oh, the bottles right. because of COVID and everything. Because of COVID, right. Everything had to be single use. Yep. Uh, so they did a great job. Yeah, Kristen and her team did a great job with figuring out the single use cans. That's amazing. What a, yeah, what an initiative, man. I, I love that you did that and it, it makes it makes a huge difference. Yeah, the, I, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of plastic water bottles, hundreds and hundreds of thousands. I would lo really love to see that happen across all productions. Something I wanted to try and start with NBC and started the process. And I've heard after I started the process that it, it, it's something that may actually come to fruition this year on, on many of their shows. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. 
Knock on wood. Man, is, is, is Waterkeepers getting involved in that at all with, with that kind of stuff? That, that was just, just my own personal. Thing, just your own personal thing. Wow. In support of, you know, just plastic's the biggest pollution of the ocean right now. Yeah, it's huge. Holy cow, man. I, I just love the work you're up to. And like I well, said, just you, the, the way you show up in the world and just your, your whole career and your whole trajectory and, and, and the stuff you shared today is so, so valuable, especially the stuff. I mean, I feel like mastery kept coming up over and over again, right? Whether it's internal mastery or external mastery of a craft, yeah. it just, you, you're such an embodiment of that, of just the, the immersing yourself in a craft, the sticking with it, the, the, the tenacity, the consistency, and the not letting the little bullshit stuff that could derail you forever derail you forever and, and you keep coming back and i just love that yeah you're going to face hurdles all the time yeah i mean it's kind of like i, I it's, it's it's a little bit like the stock market mm. when when you know not everything hits yeah you know and it's kind of like you know there's projects that i started that you know spent a couple of years on that just didn't happen yeah and rather than get upset about them or you know give up it just it's just something that didn't happen mm. but everything you do there's something some takeaway right and it's the same thing I tell my 22-year-old son. It's like, you know, if you sit around worried about making the wrong decision, not making any movement, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. You got to do something. And even if you find out that's not what you want to do, or even if, if it doesn't work out, you learn from that. Yeah. And the learning is not that it did, that you did it wrong, or you did. It, I mean, you, maybe you did do, do it wrong, but that, that's learning too. Yeah. It's just try again just do something else or that wasn't meant to be you know what yeah it's all feedback it wasn't the car it's a hand ring yeah the, it's you know there's a lot of um we can go back to what people trust me, what people say and i want to go back to this because i have a couple of examples of it yeah um when i say trust your gut trust your instincts when you have an idea about something and i spent a lot of time in the early years uh, you know when I had some money to investing, I would get up early in the morning and I would look look at the stock market and sorry, I would look at the stock market and do my own kind of like analysis of stocks and stuff like that. Back in 2014, there was a thing called Bitcoin that emerged. <laughs> and and I was really interested in this cryptocurrency. This looks like really something really and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna call my business manager, I'm gonna call my financial advisor, I'm gonna get me some Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And I just found this email the other day and I go, Hey, so-and-so and so-and-so. I don't want to say their names because yeah. I don't want to embarrass them right now because they'll never. <laughs> I really would like to get some Bitcoin. I was able to get like five coins already, but it's going up. It's at 420 a coin right now. 420. 420 a coin. <laughs> and I want to get like 300 to 500 coins right, right away as soon yeah. as possible. I need your help. It's not easy to do. My business manager Terrible idea. Terrible idea. Nobody knows where cryptocurrency is going. I don't recommend it. Mm. Thanks for your help. My financial advisor. I don't know where anybody, I don't know who's doing it. I don't know anything. Financial advisor. Mm. Right? So I scrambled, get what I can. You know, it, back then it was, you couldn't just put a credit card down and buy it. Yeah, yeah. You had to, you had to find somebody uh, through a web page. You had to, Looked at, you had to get them, you had to arrange a personal in-person meeting where they give you a code, you trade codes, you have to, it was, it was a pain in the butt. It took time. Yeah. So if I say I didn't get as much as I wanted, but, um, but I, I wanted to write my business manager back <laughs> and say, here's a $10 million error <laughs> in, in judgment, but he would only feel bad. Why would do that? Right, 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 right. My, my, my point is trust your gut, trust your instincts. Yeah. I've made that decision on other things like um, Tesla. I was one of the first people to buy Tesla. I own the very first Roadster, the 200th Tesla ever made. I was, I was part of the, you know, the IPO. Um, if you see something that you believe in, go after it. Don't, don't, it doesn't matter what other people show you or tell you. Yeah. Um, that's just two examples. But that, that's in life too, yeah. you know? Yeah. That, that's, you know, don't let your influences be, be be tempered by other people's judgments. And I think the, in just wrapping that all up in a bow, really, from the things you've been talking about here, but I think that the, the way that you, at least from what I think I'm hearing, the way that you really are able to, to listen to that and to be able to trust it is twofold. Number one, I think it goes back to mastery again, because in your world, pre all this stuff, you really cultivated the ability to spot trends. 
right? Yeah. You were really like, you really immerse yourself in what's going on in the world, what's next. So then when you have something come up in your gut that says, Bitcoin, I need to invest in that, you trust that because you've immersed yourself in spotting trends. And then the second part is the meditation part is making sure you're quieting the noise enough to know what your gut is even telling you. And so when you have those things together, it sounds like you, you no, have a winning good, combination yeah. to make a, make a decision. So that's, that's, that's awesome. Very well put. I didn't, I didn't even analyze it that well. So I, my, my mind, I'm like an autopilot. I really do operate from this kind of this uh, autopilot. You know, I just, I do the things that, that seem to create calm in my life and seem to create, um, peace. Yep. And practice methods and do things that, 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 that they work. They just work. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that everything's cherry and everything is rosy and everything great. I still get in arguments with my fight, my wife. I still get in arguments with my wife. I still, kids, my kids still fight. And, and, but, but, but the highs, you know, I, you know, it's not, the lows are not as low as anymore. Mm. You know, I don't have any issues with depression or I don't have any, you know, I've been sober for a long while now. And I, I really attribute it to just, you know, finding this sense of peace with myself and, and I really, I, I credit meditation as much as anything. Yeah. It was one of the core reasons that I was able to, core things like skills I could latch on to that everything else spawn from that. Yeah. Huge. It was a practice, you know, something, you know, then everything else became a good springboard from that. Do you think that the six phase is a good place for people to start if they've never really meditated or haven't found something that works or is there something? Yeah, I think there's, there's three I would recommend. Okay. Personally, I yeah. think six phase is good. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I also, I also think Emily Fletcher's M word is a good one. Cool. Yep. She's great. And then oddly enough, what, what I've turned people on to, this is before I even knew about six days was Deepak Chopra and Oprah Winfrey's 15 day challenge. Awesome. And they, there are specific to certain subjects, each one. Um, and they're like 12, 15 minutes and they're, they were very simple. They guide you through and it's, it's, um, that worked really well with my sister, Julie, mm. who, when I first told her about meditation, said there's no way in hell she could ever learn meditation. <laughs> yep. And now she's an avid meditator. Now she's so, a meditator. Yeah. Awesome. Right. So we'll have those in the those, show notes Those are the sure. three that I would refer to people to, to, to jump in on or get started on because they're, they're easy and... Useful. Right? Yeah. yeah. Powerful. I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise, you know... TM or <laughs> yeah, TM was, I, I went and did the TM training and yeah. it, it was great, but it, I had already done a bunch of other you, things. You, I don't think it would have been evolved, good for me. Yeah. 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 The or first just sitting time. quiet and listen. Yeah. That's yeah. people get frustrated with that. Yeah. It can be very frustrating if yeah. you're just starting out. So yeah, no, the ones you said, I think are great. I haven't, I actually haven't seen the Deepak Oprah ones. I'll have to I'll look at the, 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 those together. I've seen Ziva and obviously the, uh, yeah. all the, the Emily stuff. And of course, six phase. So we'll put all those in the show notes and I have a, a small gift for you. Okay. So, so my big thing is, I think you may even know this about me is I'm I'm a big sock guy. Uh, and it's funny. I try to pick socks that I feel like are, are going to embody something about the guest. I picked Bob Ross socks today for myself, <laughs> which is great because you ended up saying you would love to be a painter. So that actually worked. <laughs> but for you, because I know you are an avid surfer, oh, look at uh, that. I got you some, uh, some surfing socks here with, I see, I thought this was a goat when it's I an got ass. them. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's why I'm having right. Jason Gilbert's <laughs> calling me an ass on a surfboard now. Thank you. I promise when I saw them, I thought it was a goat. And I was like, goat, like greatest of all time. It's the goat. I love it. But you're the, an ass, now go surfing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are, you are, if you, if you're an ass, you're the most wise, loving, compassionate, uh, kind hearted ass I've ever met. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy these socks. Uh, these are for you. I love it. Yeah, my so wife will appreciate them too. That's awesome, and she can she can wear them as well. And then the last thing that I'll ask you, thank here you. That, yeah, you're very welcome. Thank I you for it. for being here. And the uh, the final question I have for you here, uh, I'm going to give you our our pillow here because we have all of our guests ruin my white pillow since this is about ruining podcasting. And while you're signing this, I'd love to just know what is something that you would love to ruin on this planet before you leave, like some some belief system, some way that people are operating in the world that it may be uh, improbable. Or impossible or unpopular to do it, but it's something you really want to make a dent in before you leave this planet. I'd love to kind of know what that is for you. Yeah, I, I'm finding the urge to say what what, cut, what pops into my head. Yeah, but we can always edit it out if you if you say. No, it it's, not, it's nothing. It's nothing bad. It's just I, I, you know, I want to do better. I want to be better. I want to. <laughs> I want to say something better. No, uh, <laughs> whatever's in your heart, no, I know is going to be great. Really, I, I, what, what, which keeps dragging. I mean, coming to my head, my gut, everything is is judgment. Mm. If if we could get people to stop judging other people, I think it would change their their 
viewpoints a lot. If we could eliminate judgment, that would, I mean, that's a huge tall order. My next, my second one was self negative talk, but eliminate negative self talk. But, but judgment, I think is probably big. Mm. If we could get rid of judgment. And I say that, I say that coming from my heart because I know I, I have judgment too every day. Sure. We talked I'll about it earlier and, yeah. and boy, if you could eliminate judgment, you look, everybody's got, to, everybody has a clean slate, mm. you know, there's no far left, no far right. And, we're just we're just people sharing the same place, yeah. Maybe if, the same thing. Maybe if we were less judgmental of others, we'd be less judgmental of ourselves. So your negative self talk secondary oh, one would take yeah. care of itself. So there you go. <laughs> See how efficient you are. You're such a master of your craft. You even have Thanks. efficiency in what you want to ruin, uh, which which I absolutely love. I I, I love that, Kent. Thank yeah, you, Jason. I, yeah, that's I think that's really really awesome. Yeah. And uh, and it's been just so fun to talk to you. And I'd love to know just what is what is something besides Waterkeeper Alliance, obviously, and all that stuff that that's going on there. What else are you working on now that you'd love people to check out? How can people continue to follow you and continue the conversation? Um, well, we're, we're, we're launching a new platform, but probably not until the summer. Okay. So not, there's nothing really new to talk about there right now, because I really feel that in all the research that I've done, um, we, I did a, you know, a series Ninja, Ninja talks for, did about nine episodes of that. Yep. That was super fun. Uh, which was a lot of fun. But as I was building out this next phase of the, the platform, um, what I discovered in October was a huge thing called zoom fatigue. Yes. And Major we did a little Zoom research fatigue. and a little stuff and like people are just done with, with Zoom and fatigue. So uh, so I'm doing some other research and stuff into different um, technologies and that keep it more interactive and live feeling, mm. which will culminate in a new platform probably this summer. That's awesome. That sounds really exciting. Uh, but I don't have a name for it yet because it's uh, it's still forming. That is um, awesome. And then Ninja Warrior is coming back, which is good. We're going to production of that. But uh yeah, just yet to be seen on the other stuff. I mean, Waterkeeper's taking a lot of my time right now, which is yeah. good. And spending time with my family, surfing, enjoying yeah. life. I love that, man. Keep up all the amazing work you're doing. Like I said, we'll put all the stuff in the show notes. Whenever you do have the platform come out, we'll definitely share it with the audience as well so they know. Uh, just so grateful you're here. So grateful to call you a friend. And, and thank you for coming all the way out here and yeah. sitting on the couch and having this thank conversation. Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate it. You're amazing, brother. You can love find me on brother. Instagram, too. There you go, Instagram. We'll put the Instagram there as well. Yeah. Guys, listen, seriously, follow Kent and follow Waterkeepers. Look at the Waterkeepers Alliance. Uh, and uh, he's just an amazing man, as you can see. Watch Ninja Warrior and tell all your friends that they have not already watched it. Start watching it. And one last question, actually. Matt Eisman, who I love, he was on Ninja Talks, the, the episode yeah. that I came on, uh, and he's the host of American Ninja Warrior. Uh, who do you think would do better, Matt Eisman on Hell's Kitchen or Gordon Ramsay on America's Nin American Ninja Warrior? That's a good question. Uh, boy, that's a good question. And the, the reason why it's a good question, I have to stop and think about it, is Matt took Gordon's master class. Oh, he did? Yeah, so oh, Matt's become a really good chef now in, in the off season, and Gordon's a good athlete, uh, but Gordon's big. You know, that, I think that's going to be a, I will be a tight, I don't know if I could call that. I, I think Matt might win that one. Yeah, I, I think he might too. Matt is so multi-talented with yeah. all the stuff he's done. Although I would really love to see Gordon try to climb the wall. I think him scaling the wall would just be really fun yeah, to watch. Yeah, we'll get him out there. <laughs> we'll get, we'll get him out, out there this point. year. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks again for being Thank here, you, Ken. Jason. Thank you guys for watching My and we'll pleasure. see you next time. Peace out. Thanks guys. Awesome. Thank you, my man. I appreciate it. That's all I got for you today, folks. If you love this episode, please make sure to follow us on whatever platform you're listening to it on. Give us a five-star review and a rating. So, so helpful for us, uh, especially starting this podcast. Give us a great review if you, if you love the show. Tell all your friends about us. Screenshot this and post it on Instagram and tag me in it so I can send you some love back. DM me with any of your feedback or any questions, and let's keep ruining shit together. Sending you guys so much love and cannot wait to see you again super soon. Peace.